Welcome back to this long study of Revelation at the Dove Church. The last couple of sessions we've been in chapter 12, where we saw an enormous dragon who's identified as Satan, menacing a woman who is faithful Israel and her child, who it says will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. That line is taken from Psalm 2, and we should hold it in mind, um, because it's the child who gets to rule, and no one else. The action in chapter 12 is seen from the viewpoint of heaven, from where the dragon is unceremoniously hurled down to earth, where he will wage war against those who keep God's commandments and hold fast their testimony in Jesus. That's chapter 12, verse 17. The dragon has been described in largely symbolic or metaphorical terms, but now he's crashed down to earth. So what would that look like? Chapter 12 ends with him finding himself on earth, in verse 13, and continuing to pursue the woman and her seed or her offspring but he's prevented from harming her chapter ends with him enraged and going off to wage war against her and her seed so from the perspective of heaven it looks as if he exits stage left so to speak um, at the end of the chapter and continues his evil business on earth revelation twelve twelve says this rejoice you heavens and you who dwell in them but woe to the earth and to the sea the earth and the sea because the devil has gone down to you he is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short so that sets up what follows. Chapter 13 cuts to John standing alone on the seashore, watching the dragon's emissary emerge from the sea. This time we're going to look at the whole of chapter 13, so this will be a longer study. Let's pray. Father, we live in a broken world where we see the devil at work around us. We live with fear and suffering and with death father i pray as we read and engage with these rather grim words that you've given us that we'll see your great salvation and hope that you have set before us help us to hear what the spirit is saying to the churches in jesus name amen so Revelation 13. The dragon stood or I was placed on the seashore and I saw a beast coming out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads with ten crowns on its horns and on each head a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard but it had feet like those of a bear and a mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have had a fatal wound, but the wound had been healed. The whole world was filled with wonder and followed the beast. People worshipped the dragon because they had given authority to the beast. And they also worshipped the beast and asked, Who is like the beast? Who can wage war against it? The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies to exercise its authority for 42 months. It opens its, its mouth to blaspheme God, to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. It has given power to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. And it was given authority over every tribe, people, language and nation. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. All whose names have not been written in the Lamb's Book of Life the lamb who was slain from the creation of the world whoever has ears let him hear if anyone is to go into captivity into captivity they will go if anyone is to be killed with the sword with the sword they will be killed this calls for patient endurance and faithfulness 
on the part of God's people. Then I saw a second beast coming out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. It exercised all the authority of the first beast on its behalf and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. And it performed great signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to the earth in full view of the people because of the signs it was given power to perform on behalf of the first beast it deceived the inhabitants of the earth it ordered them to set up an image in honour of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived this second beast has given power to breathe uh, to give breath to the image of the first beast so that the image could speak and calls all who refused to worship the image to be killed and also forced all people great and small rich and poor slave and free to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark which is the name of the beast or the number of its name this calls for wisdom let the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast for it is the number of a man that number is six 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 okay some some context before we look at the text in chapter 13 we're presented with two beasts one comes from the sea and is the mirror image of the dragon the other comes from the earth it spoke like a dragon and exercised all the authority of the first beast so we have a sort of inverted trinity here the dragon is the source of evil it's the devil and satan if you remember and the beast from the sea closely resembles it remember jesus said if you've seen me you've seen my father it appears to have survived a, a mortal wound and then the beast who comes from the earth, the second beast, is given power to breathe, uh, to give breath into the image of the first beast. It acts in the role of a kind of unholy spirit, if you like. So there's a sort of anti-trinity going on here with the dragon and these two beasts. It's worth having a look at two Old Testament precedents for these beasts before uh, we look too closely at the text um, again I'm, I'm asking what the first receivers of revelation would have understood by these by these images um, the old testament was their frame of reference so the first is at the end of the book of job where god challenges job to look at his amazing creation and in particular two unparalleled creatures that he's made so the first is behemoth a land creature uh, in the second half of Job, chapter 40. Um, it is the work of God. It, it, it can seem docile, eating grass like an ox, verse 15, and yet it's powerful and has the potential for great violence, verses 16 to 18, and it's untamable, verse 24. God revels in the wonder of his creation here, almost boasting about it to Job, he says in verse 24, Can anyone capture its eyes, or trap it, or pierce its nose? In verse 19, the Septuagint uh, version, uh, not the Hebrew, um, has this. It's slightly different. It says, This is the chief of the creation of the Lord, made to be played with by its angels. That's... Um, Brenton's translation, famous translation, made to be played with as if it were a pet. So behemoth is it's awesome and powerful, but in the end, it's one of God's creatures. So that's the first creature that God points out to Job. And the second is in the whole of Job 41, which describes Leviathan, the sea beast, as glorious and powerful. The images and the language it uses is rather different from it from the from behemoth so note that, that the septuagint uh, arranges the verses a bit differently between chapters 40 and 41 so the numbers in in the verse numbers in 41 are, are different from our bibles 
Um, Leviathan is, is invulnerable, uh, verses 1 to 9, powerful and graceful. Um, 12 to 17, it, it breathes smoke and fire, 18 to 21. It's terrifying and unlike Behemoth, actively aggressive. It's an instigator of chaos, verses 25 to 32. It's intelligent and proud, 33 and 34. This creature belongs in the deep. It owns the deep. In fact, the lowest parts of the deep are its captive. So, um, Job forty-one twenty-three to twenty-five in the uh, Septuagint, at Psalm um, thirty-one to thirty-four in our Bibles, says this: He makes the deep boil like a brazen cauldron, and he regards the sea as a pot of ointment. In the lowest part of the deep as a captive. He reckons the deep as his range. There is nothing upon the earth like to him, formed to be sported with by my angels. He beholds every high thing. He is the king of all that are in the waters. That's Brenton's translation again. Now in the Greek, the lowest part of the deep, is literally the Tartarus of the abyss. Remember Tartarus and abyss, these are the terms that we've had before. And Leviathan keeps them captive. In chapter 40, verse 19, in the Septuagint, Septuagint again, Behemoth, the land creature, is made to be played with by his angels, by God's angels. And in 41.25, the language is almost identical of Leviathan. Both of these creatures are completely unparalleled in creation and dangerous on earth, yet they are like pets to the angels. They are to be toyed with, mocked even. So that's Job, Job 40 and 41. Now the other reference is more specific. The old, uh, it, it, it's um, in Daniel chapter 7, which is an important chapter which we've visited many times before in these studies. In a series of visions in Daniel 7, uh, Daniel sees that, uh, verse 3, four great beasts, each different from the others, came up out of the sea. The first is like a lion, the second is like a bear, and these are, are predatory creatures. Uh, verse 6, the third beast have four heads, and it was given authority to rule and then the most frightening creature is the fourth beast in verse 7 it had large huge iron teeth it crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left it was different from all the former beasts and it had ten horns so between these four beasts they have seven heads and ten horns when we looked at this chapter a little while ago we associated these horns with the empires and the kings that rose in the space of the fallen Babylonian empire. And John is using similar language um, here of the beast from the sea, the first beast. He isn't specific, but it seems likely that his early listeners would have associated this with Rome. Um, and it's certainly linked with Babylon, which we will see more clearly in the coming chapters so let's look at the text itself revelation 13 verse 1 the dragon stood or possibly i was placed on the shore of the sea and i saw a beast coming out of the sea it had 10 horns and seven heads and 10 crowns on its horns and on each head a blasphemous name there is a discrepancy in the Greek text in verse 1. Uh, the common reading in modern translations is the dragon stood on the shore of the sea. And this is sometimes tacked onto the end of chapter 12 as verse 18. So the NRSV, for example, reads like this. Um, Revelation 12, 17 and 18. Then the dragon was angry with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her children those who keep the commandments of God and hold the testimony of Jesus. Then the dragon took his stand on the sand of the seashore. And then chapter 13 begins with, And I saw the beast 
coming out of the sea. Now, the difference in his texts comes down to one Greek letter. Uh, which at some point was either added in or missed out <laughs> during the copying process. It isn't entirely sure, entirely clear which. So the word is either estathe, which it's or, 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 or he stood, or estathen, for I stood. It's, it's also a, an, an aorist, which, which is a past tense. It shows a completed action. Um, and it's passive. So it's quite hard to translate that into English. Um, when you translate stand into a passive past tense, you, you get something like he, he was stood, or perhaps he was placed because it's passive. So it happened to him. So if, if the new, the, the Greek letter N is real, it means I was placed. And if there's no N, it reads he was placed. Most modern texts go without the N for um, good reasons, I'm, I'm sure. But I'm, I'm not qualified to, to comment on the veracity of the Greek sources. But I can make a literary case. And I, and I think he here uh, reads uncomfortably. In chapter 12, the dragon is all action. He swept, flung, and stood in verse 4. He fought in verse 7. In verse 13, he saw and he pursued. And in verse 15, he, he spewed water for his mouth. And finally, he went off in verse 17. All of these are, are clear actions. And some of these verbs are quite dynamic. Swept, flung, um, fought, uh, spewed etc. Um, in all of this, there's one dramatic reversal where he was hurled down to the earth. And, th and this, this verb, this verb an, an aorist passive, in fact, is repeated three times for maximum emphasis. So in the middle of the dragon being busy, being dynamic, being active, there is this huge reversal where he is unceremoniously ejected from heaven. He's hurled and he's hurled and he's hurled down to earth. Um, and it repeats it in verse 9 three times in the Greek text for emphasis. But even in his passivity, you see, he's the object of an action, even as he's being hurled. It's, it's, it's still dramatic. He's being hurled. He's not just being dropped or, or, or asked politely to leave. He's being hurled. Um, so for this dragon to be placed on the seashore or caused to stand on the seashore, feels inconsistent. But for John, who is the witness and recorder of all of these things, it's perfectly consistent for him to be placed or caused to stand on the seashore. And the, then the following clause, I saw the beast coming out of the sea, follows quite naturally. Um, now, that seems to be a lot of words for a very simple point, but you can't just say, I disagree with the translation without explaining why. So I disagree with the translation, and that's why I disagree with it. So verse 1, I was placed, I'm going with that, I was placed on the seashore, and I saw a beast coming out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads and ten crowns on its horns, and on each head a blasphemous name. So let's have that's a question. Tell me how to question. Think about this. At what point... In biblical history, does the beast from the sea emerge? At what point in biblical history does the beast from the sea emerge? So, here are some suggestions. It could be connected with the sons of God and the daughters of men in Genesis 6, 1-3. to That's a possibility. Or, it could be to do with the contemporary world when John is writing these things with the destruction of Jerusalem uh, the diaspora of the Jews and the persecution of the church by the Roman Empire 
or it could be pointing to some future event that we haven't seen yet or it could be something entirely different those are just some suggestions so at what point in biblical history does the beast from the sea emerge so John standing on the seashore I saw a beast coming out of the sea the sea as we've seen before represents chaos and darkness it's the unknowable deep sometimes it's even the grave Jonah chapter 2 describes the sea the deep as the grave it's the home of Leviathan as we've just seen who holds the Tartarus of the abyss captive there in Daniel 7 we saw this a whole series of fierce beasts arise from the sea imposing dominion on the earth and this beast has ten horns and seven heads and ten crowns on its horns. It is identical with the dragon. The only difference is the arrangement of the crowns on its horns rather than on its heads. And, and the order in which the description comes is slightly different too. Now these crowns are diatomata. Diadematta. They are uh, crowns of sovereignty. And they're different from the Stephanos, the Victor's crowns, which are laid down by the elders in Revelation 4 10. I think that's quite an important point. So the obvious question is Is the beast of Revelation 13 the same creature as the dragon in Revelation 12, which we've seen? hurled down to earth and here is an identical creature coming out of the sea is this the same creature in fact so <laughs> the answer that's a difficult question i think and, and the answer is yes and no the dragon is a spiritual creature and the beast from the sea is its earthly form or, or manifestation they're indistinguishable but they are different entities in verse 4 people worship both the dragon and the beast so they're not the same creature their re relationship in fact parodies the relationship of god the father and god the son jesus referred to god as his father whatever God the Father did the Son did and the relationship between the dragon and the beast is is, is somewhat similar to that so the temptation and it is quite a powerful temptation is to count its heads horns and crowns and try to identify which nations and kings and powers are being signaled here if indeed any are being signaled in the Old Testament this kind of language as we've seen in Daniel is usually identified with the powers the political powers that threaten God's people such as Egypt or Assyria or Babylon or the kings of Greece in fact um, these are easily associated with, with frightening creatures and monsters of various kinds um, particular particular the beasts in 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 daniel with their many heads and horns which we identified with the the seleucid greek kingdoms antiochus uh, the fourth so the old prophets speaking against these particular kingdoms were were pointing out the satanic powers behind these kingdoms that were constantly trying to ensnare and oppress and threaten the nation of Israel God's people Israel but in the New Testament God's people in the church are not defined by a nation or a kingdom or a political entity that can be overthrown in the way that Jerusalem was overthrown that's an important point 
Now, we are still oppressed and, and threatened by the forces of the world from time to time and from place to place. But these are revealed in rather different ways. We are as likely, perhaps more likely, uh, to be compromised by deviant teaching uh, and by disunity in, in the body of Christ or, or perhaps by flattery and temptation than we are by direct oppression and persecution because the church has no specific political identity it isn't in a, a place it's everywhere it's it, it's through it's it, it's 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 woven through human society the world over in fact in the new testament persecution and hardship are seen as, very much as the bread and butter of the church is something to be Embrace, for example, Paul teaches 2 Corinthians 4, 8 to 10. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry about in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. Where the church is persecuted, it grows stronger so carry on with that verse on each head of the beast was a blasphemous name now various roman emperors domitian uh, for example assumed titles like lord and savior son of god etc so it would be natural for the first audience of revelation to think of rome at this point point to the, the emperor Domitian or Nero which, whichever whichever emperor it is and say uh, that's a blasphemous name and they're right of course you can't go around calling yourself son of God um, maybe maybe that's what this is referring to these things are certainly consistent with the beast's aim to wage war against the the rest of the woman's offspring and Rome, at various points, certainly did seek to destroy the followers of Jesus, or at the very least to undermine them. But John's description of the beast from the sea goes beyond the mere human political and entity such as Rome and describes a, a universal satanic drive towards deception, idolatry and offences of various kinds that, are, that have all revealed themselves in, in, in human cultures through history. Verse 2. The beast I saw resembled a leopard. It had feet like those of a bear and a mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. So this creature comprises elements of a leopard, a bear and a lion, showing that it is fast, powerful and fierce, consistent with the power, throne and dominion, I suppose. Um, in fact, the first three of the beasts from the sea in Daniel 7 are also like a lion, a bear and a leopard, uh, which, of course, the first audiences would have picked up because they would have been reading Daniel. And uh, these, and especially in the context of Revelation, where he uses Daniel all the time, the language of Daniel is, is used very, com very commonly. Now, these are predatory creatures, they're hunters, but they've got different characteristics. Um, so a bear is strong and steady, a, a leopard is fast and, 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 and relentless, and a, and a, and a lion is, is, is powerful. But these are, are characteristics of the beast rather than a physical description. After all, it has seven heads and ten horns, so it doesn't resemble a leopard very much. And then the dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority the beast's great authority has been conferred to the dragon and through the beast the people can see the dragon because because of this it, it, it seems invulnerable they are they ask in, in verse 4 who is like the beast who can wage war against it verse 3 one of the Heads of the beast seem to have had a, a fatal wound. But the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was filled with wonder and followed the beast. 
So this is a story of deception. A lot hangs on this word seemed. One of the beast's heads seems to have received a fatal wound, which had been healed. It's impressive. It makes it seem immortal. You don't want to fight against it because you think you can't win. Who is like the beast? Who can wage war against it, they say. But it's a simulation. It's a parody, even, of the death and resurrection of Christ. It's a fake. It's purely for demonstration purposes. There's no sense of sacrifice or service and definitely no atonement. It wants to enslave you, not to redeem you. The enemy attempts to lead people astray with a pale imitation of Christ's greatest miracle. Verse 4. People worship the dragon because he had given authority to the beast. And they also worship the beast and asked, who is like the beast? Who can wage war against it? So on the basis of this fake resurrection, people worship both the dragon and the beast. Now remember in Jesus' ministry that people were expecting him to be conquering king, as in Psalm 110, for example, um, to make uh, his enemies a footstool for his feet and to crush the kings on the day of his wrath, heaping up the dead and crushing the rulers of the earth. Some people still expect Jesus to be like this. Jesus isn't like that. He came to save the world, not to condemn it. As a suffering servant, he redeems us by his blood. So the beast is presented as strong. This admiration of, of military or, or political strength is it's a satanic characteristic. The real Messiah comes in humility. He is a suffering servant. He comes to make people free and to heal their broken hearts. But Satan always comes to do dominate, to impose himself. He comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. Five and six. The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise its authority. For 42 months, it opened its mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. The beast from the sea has seven heads. One of them is mortally wounded, but only one mouth, which it is given. Given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise its authority. The little horn in, in Daniel 7, 8, if you remember, was also given a mouth. It was given a mouth. With which it also utters proud words. And the, and the, the phrase um, in the Septuagint is, is the same. The Greek words are the same. So is this mouth given by God or by the dragon? It looks like it's the dragon. Uh, but in the end, I don't think it matters. The dragon itself acts under God's license, after all. And the beast, even though it's an anti-Messiah, still exists in God's grace. It does exist in God's grace. It's been compared with Leviathan. And God boasts about Leviathan to Job. Um... The origin of the beast landing in the sea is when he's ejected from heaven by Michael. So, John nineteen ten and 11, Pilate says to Jesus, Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said, Don't you refuse, don't you realize that I have the power to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, Jesus answered, You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above that's the truth like a Greek tragic hero locked into some cycle of destiny Satan cannot help but bring about God's purposes and his own demise by his scheming he can exercise it the beast can exercise its authority for only 42 months no more 
And this is the last reference to this 42 months, this this three and a half year broken time period. So another question. Verse 5 limits the authority of the beast to 42 months. How does this connect with the time periods mentioned in previous chapters? Verse 5 limits the authority of the beast to 42 months. How does this connect with the time periods mentioned in previous chapters? So this formidable beast opens its borrowed mouth and exercises its derived authority to blaspheme. Verse 7. It was given power to wage war, it was given power to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. And it was given authority over every tribe, people, language and nation. Again, the beast is given the ability to wage war against God's people. The, the word power is supplied by the NIV. It's not in the Greek. Um, perhaps the New King James puts it better. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. So the beast is given limited authority for 42 months to conquer God's people. But in the next bit, it's actually given authority, power, if you like, over every tribe, people, language, and nation it has limited scope to overcome god's people but it's given absolute authority over everyone else and verse 8 sums this up succinctly all the inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast all whose names have not been written in the lamb's book of life the lamb who was slain from the creation of the world the beast even the dragon have authority and power leased to them for a season. They can even fake the resurrection. But standing over everything, the linchpin that holds reality together is the lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. The lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. Verses 9 and 10. Whoever has ears, let them hear. If they don't want us to go into captivity, into captivity they will go. If they don't want us to be killed by the sword, by the sword they will be killed. This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of God's people. For the people of God, there appear to be only two options. We might find this disappointing. Captivity or death. We saw a little while ago when we were discussing the two witnesses that God's victory is often in the appearance of defeat. When Jesus died on the cross, the greatest victory looked like the ultimate defeat. And the same applies to God's people. Revelation twelve eleven again, it says, They triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, so that they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. And the reason Satan is in this murderous rage is exactly because he has been hurled down. He knows that he's lost. John writes to Smyrna by the Holy Spirit, Revelation 2, 10 and 11. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation ten days, but be faithful until death. And I will give you the crown of life. Stephanus of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. Again, we're reminded of the endurance and victory through persecution. The fact that we are here now and able publicly to discuss these things is a testimony to the faithfulness of those early brothers and sisters who received this letter and the other letters in the New Testament and established their 
testimony. So, to sum up this section on the first beast, I've got a question. What similarities and differences can you see between Revelation 13, 1 to 8, and that's this passage that we just looked at, and Daniel 7, 2 to 8? What similarities and differences can you see between Revelation 13, 1 to 8, and Daniel 7, 2 to 8? There, that's a, that's a good bit of Bible study. So let's move on. Revelation 13, verses 11 to 17. A bit of a chunk. This brings in the second beast, the beast from the earth, the behemoth figure, if you like. Let's remind ourselves. Then I saw a second beast coming out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb. But it spoke like a dragon. It exercised all the authority of the first beast, beast on its behalf. And it made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. And it performed great signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to the earth in full view of the people. Because of the signs it was given power to perform on behalf of the first beast, it deceived the inhabitants of the earth. It ordered them to set up an image in honour of the beast who was wounded with the sword and yet lived. The second beast was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that the image could speak and cause all who, who refused to worship the image to be killed. It also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark in their right hands or on their foreheads so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. So a couple of questions. How does the second beast differ from the first beast? How does the second beast differ from the first beast? And why does John note the detail that it had two horns like a lamb? It spoke like a dragon, but it had two horns like a lamb. Why does John note that detail in particular? Right, in chapter 11, we met the two witnesses that stand before the Lord of the earth. There have to be two because legal testimony requires two witnesses. <laughs> this beast, the second beast, is like one witness. It looks less imposing than the first beast and it has two horns like a lamb, but it's spoke like a dragon. How does the dragon speak? We might well ask. The people might even mistake it for Christ if they don't listen to it too, clear, too carefully. So this one is not given authority in the same way, but it advocates for the first beast. It is given the ability to perform signs, however. It calls down fire from heaven. It, it, it's a, a parody of Elijah, and in a way it's a parody of the two witnesses too, because they could do that. It's been given the ability to give breath to the image of the first beast. But this is the breath or, or a spirit that brings death to all who refuse to worship it. The opposite of the Holy Spirit, I suppose. Now there are overtones of Daniel 3 here. Remember Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego um, and Nebuchadnezzar's fiery furnace, blazing fiery furnace. So Daniel 3, 4-6 um, says these things. It says, Nations and peoples of every language are commanded to fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up, or else they will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. So the language, the language is unmistakably similar 
God's people, in this case Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, naturally refused to do this. And they say boldly to the king, verses 16 to 18, Daniel 3, We do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But if he, even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. Now that is testimony. So they went into the fire and were saved as if through death. We know the story. And if you don't know it, it's in Daniel 3. So verses 16 and 17. It, that is the second beast, forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. So a couple of questions. Why does the second beast force everyone to be marked? Why does the second beast force everyone to be marked? Second question follows on from that really. Are there places in the world in 2022 where this kind of regime exists? Are there places in the world in 2022 where this kind of regime exists this then is the regime of the second beast his work and the people <laughs> nowadays we get obsessed with the number but the point about this this mark is that it's the name of the beast. Now, the idea of bearing a name is, is scriptural. It's linked to the idea of being bearers of God's image. Remember the blessing from the end of number six. The Lord tells Moses to instruct Aaron to bless the children of Israel. The Lord bless you and keep you and, and so on. And the chapter ends with this, number six. 27 so in doing this in putting my in blessing the people they will put my name on the israelites and i will bless them they will put my name on the israelites and i will bless them in pronouncing god's blessing they put his name on the people so this, this idea of being god's proxy is found throughout the old testament throughout the bible indeed they were to bear the Lord, to represent him in their everyday life as a witness among the nations. They were his kingdom of priests, his holy nation. Exodus 19, 5 and 6 has this. It says, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation and this is carried on into the church for example 1 peter 2 9 um revelation 1 6 we are a kingdom of priests and we saw the people of god already being being sealed in revelation 7 in, in, in a passage uniting the people of, of faithful israel with, with the community of the whole church remember that the 144,000 was sealed we'll meet them again next time i guess um, and then there's this this unnumberable multitude that comes on the back of that so here we we have the antithesis of this this is all the inhabitants of the earth whose names have not been written in the book of life in verse 8 and they're sealed with the name of the false messiah and also note these people are forced unlike god's servants for god's servants it's a privilege to receive his name to bear his name to be identified with him 
these people are forced. The second beast in doing this effectively creates a totalitarian regime. We're familiar with that kind of thing. So while the primary role of the second beast is to be the prophet and the proclaimer of the first beast, he is no evangelist. So let's have a look. Verse 12. He exercised all the authority of the first beast. He made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast. He compelled them. Verse 14. It deceived the inhabitants of the earth. It ordered them to set up an image in honour of the first beast. Deceived. Ordered. Verse 15. It caused all who refused to worship the image to be killed. It's a murderer. It forced all people to receive the mark. It coerces. It murders. It deceives. And it spoke like a dragon. How does the dragon speak? That's how a dragon speaks. As Jesus said to the Jewish leaders, John eight forty four, You belong to your father, the devil. And you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth. There is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his own native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. The mark is the name of the first beast and the dragon, which leads us to the last bit of the chapter, verse 18. This calls for wisdom, John says. Let the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast, <laughs> for it is the number of a man. That number is 666. So if you like crosswords, you love this. So remember that numbers tell us about qualities, not just about quantities. And John tells the person with insight to calculate the number of the beast. It's a man's number, or perhaps it's mankind's number. Why might 666 be an appropriate number for the beast? For man's number. Why might 666 be an appropriate number for the beast? For man's number. So, before the adoption of the decimal-based number system that we all know and love, numbers were expressed as alphabetic letters. Think of Roman numerals, for example. They work like this. It has the interesting effect of giving written text a numerical value. And this goes for names, too. So, names in ancient languages have numeric values now the only earliest known example of this is um, the assyrian king sargon the second he's mentioned in the old testament um, in the 8th century bc who built the wall of Khorsabad, 16,283 cubits long to correspond with the numerical value of his name he built the wall of Khorsabad. 16,283 cubits long to correspond with the numerical value of his name. I don't think anyone knows exactly how that works out, but he did. So in John's time, it was quite common to use numbers to represent names, either as a, as a shorthand or, or as a riddle. In fact, some graffiti at Pompeii, which is contemporary with Revelation, more or less, um, has this. I love the girl whose name is Phi Mu Epsilon. I love the girl whose name is Phi Mu Epsilon, which works out to 545. Five. So it's like he said, I love 545, five, something like that. So the idea that names have numbers is, is quite common in the ancient world. Um, common, but not simple. Um, it's a puzzle. It's supposed to be a puzzle. There's a game called Gematria, which they used to play, um, work out the numbers of names. Um, and there are different methods of working these things out, different ciphers, if you like, different codes. 
Now, we naturally try to work out whose name adds up to 666. And it turns out that if you use different codes, different ciphers, and a bit of ingenuity, almost any name adds up to 666. It's not all that helpful, actually. I don't believe that the intention of this is for us to speculate pointlessly. Uh, and people have ever since it was written. And Irenaeus, the... Um, ancient bishop of Leon in the second or third century um, complaining that, that, that people are doing this even then um, so we would like to think that the original recipients of, of Revelation would have got it but I don't think they did so what can we say for sure about this number not a lot actually there are no clear Old Testament references to 666. Um, Solomon received 666 talents of gold in 2 Chronicles 9, but it's hard to make very much of that. But 666, it tells us, is the number of man or the number of a man. So throughout Revelation, John is giving us patterns of sevens. In fact, he does this throughout his gospel as well. Um, that indicate completeness following the seven days of creation Genesis 1. Everything is created in six days and then God rested on the seventh day. The seventh day is holy. In particular, mankind was created on the sixth day. So six is the number of mankind. And six, 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 it's a triple emphasis. Remember, triple emphasis. It's a sort of culmination, the epitome of mankind and of incompleteness. It's like a demonic parody of God's created order shown in the number seven. It can't do seven, so it'll do six. So what are we to do with this number? My thought, for what it's worth, which might not be much, is that 666 is a symbolic number, referring to this unholy trinity of evil that we've seen, the dragon and these two beasts, the beast from the sea and the beast from the land, and to their, their human imitation of God on the earth, uh, with all the, the blasphemies and the, the murder and the deception, that that's an intimidation that that entails. I think that's what 666 means. I think trying to work out this code for a name will perhaps always be a pointless exercise <laughs> though it would be no surprise at all it will be no surprise i should say uh if some future dictator has a name that works out to 666 so we should perhaps be on the lookout for that so maybe it's not quite so pointless we are in fact told to do it to calculate it so that's it for Revelation 13. Let's just finish with a question here. An important question after all that. What hope for believers can you see in this chapter? What hope for believers can you see in this chapter? Thank you for bearing with me. That was a whole long one. And next time we will launch into chapter 14. See you then.